This is Bob McFetridge with Beck with Electric. I'd like to thank you for downloading our M6200 training series. And in this session, we're going to be talking about advanced line drop compensation. And we'll be covering the topics of capped compensation, VAR bias, and remote voltage bias. And again, we're focusing in on the M6200A single phase regulator control for this series. So, in the last session, we talked about line drop compensation and the ability to raise the voltage at the regulator as the load increases so that we can regulate the voltage at some point downstream of the regulator known as the load center. And we realized that under with normal line drop compensation, as the current increases, the voltage increases. As the power factor goes away from leading, as it goes leading, the voltage at the bus is going to have to increase. We also know that as the current drops, the voltage will drop at the bus. And as the power factor goes lagging, the voltage will drop at the bus. The issue with line drop compensation is that it can get you in trouble if you don't understand these parameters and know on any given circuit what their normal batteries are going to be. And if you don't, and it changes by more than expectations are, then the voltage is going to change, and you can get into some either very high or very low voltages. So, uh, typical applications where this could happen would be if you're doing switching or sectionalizing, especially on a line regulator, or if you're trying to use LDC to coordinate with the operation of switch capacitor banks downstream of the regulator, or if you're paralleling transformers, which uh, really is not covered under the 6200A, but we'll discuss it briefly just to point out the application. Works. So again, if we were to add a R of 15, for instance, at full load, we would be providing 15 volts. At negative full load, it would be minus 15 volts. So with normal line drop, whatever your R and X settings are, those are the settings for the amount of voltage that will be applied at full scale. It'll be linear in its application, and it's bidirectional. So in one direction of current flow, it will make the voltage increase at the bus. In the other direction of current flow, it would actually make the voltage decrease at the bus. Now, if we were to cap it, and in this case, let's say we cap it at 5 volts. Notice for a 15 volt, we still have the slope of the 15, but once we get to 5 volts, it will not apply any more additional compensation in either direction. Likewise with the 5 volts or the 10 volts. So the idea of the capped compensation is it allows you to have a higher voltage value for your R and your X to have that higher slope, but still afford you the insurance that no matter what's happening with the load, you'll never apply more than X number of volts total compensation. So in this case, my bus voltage will never be 5 volts higher or 5 volts lower than its normal band center, depending on the load conditions. And let's see why it's important. Let's take this case here where we have a set of line regulators. And normally, we got a set of line regulators here and here. And we've got the normal open point. And so this regulator is regulating this zone. And this regulator is regulating this zone. And let's say we've got maybe 100 amps of load current on each regulator. Now, if we were to do some sectionalizing and open up this breaker after closing in this tie point, we would see that this regulator has now picked up additional load. So it was regulating only up to here. Now it's picked up this additional load. So what that means is if we had normal line drop compensation, 
and we were calculating the settings on its normal loading conditions in this sexualizing scheme when we pick up this additional load that's going to force the voltage to be even higher here and we risk over voltaging the customers very close to the regulator so with the capped compensation we could put a cap on there so no matter how much load we pick up we know that the voltage will never be above a certain level here at the regulator now the next possible use for cap compensation is in coordination with capacitor max so if we were to use a negative x on our regulators and we would look at negative reactants so we're going to be looking at a negative x what we would see is at lagging power factors it would want to bring the voltage at the bus lower which is good if we're using a voltage controlled capacitor bank because if we have a lagging power factor that means we need more capacitance and if we were to lower the voltage at the regulator or the bus then that would induce the capacitor banks downstream to close in if they were voltage controlled capacitors. Likewise, if we get too far leading, we have too many capacitor banks on, it induces the voltage to be raised at the bus, which would then in turn possibly turn one or two of the capacitor banks off. So negative X is a viable way of coordinating downstream capacitor banks if they are voltage controlled capacitor banks with the regulator. So basically what we'll do is we'll shift the regulator's bands accordingly depending on whether we need the capacitance or we don't need the capacitance. Now, for voltage reduction though, we would need to be in the exact opposite because in voltage reduction we want the voltage to actually be reduced and we're going to turn on all of our downstream capacitor banks which is going to throw us leading so in the previous example leading voltage caused us to want to raise the voltage which would be counteractive to the voltage reduction so in normal mode we want to use a positive x but in voltage reduction, I mean a negative x, but in voltage reduction mode we would want to switch to a positive X and in a positive X it would accomplish the same thing if I have a lagging power factor which means I don't have a lot of capacitors downstream to hold up the voltage I'm not I'm actually going to raise the voltage at the band because I can't go that much lower I don't have the voltage support down line so I need to keep my front end voltage up high but if I go leading, which means I have a lot of capacitors downstream holding up the voltage, I can actually lower my bus voltage even more because I'm at a lower voltage than the rest of the circuit. So the concept would be with reactants and coordinating of capacitor banks, you would want to use negative reactants when you're not in voltage reduction mode so that a lagging power factor would lower the voltage at the bus therefore encouraging downline capacitors to close lagging a leading power factor would raise the voltage at the bus therefore encouraging capacitor banks close to the source to open but in reduction mode we want the exact opposite because we're anticipating that we want to have a low voltage but we also want to have capacitor banks on downstream to flatten the voltage profile across the whole circuit so we can bring the whole circuit down lower. So knowing that we're going to have a leading power factor, we want to actually be able to lower the voltage more in that case because that means we have enough capacitance downstream to keep that downstream voltage up on its own. So that would typically how why we would apply it. But why we need the capping of it would be shown here. So this say in our normal mode, we have a lot of switch capacitor banks downstream of our regulator. And our regulator's got a negative six. So what that means is typically these capacitors would be coordinated in their time delays to come on and off before the regulator to reduce temps on the regulator. So normally if we leave band, the cap banks are going to time out before the regulator, which will have a much longer time delay, typically 120 to 180 seconds. But the negative six will keep it coordinated in such a way that if we 
go too far leading because we have too many capacitor banks on for the amount of load will actually raise the voltage here which would induce one or more of the capacitor banks close to the source to come off. So the idea of this approach would be to allow the capacitors to regulate the voltage on the circuit as the primary regulating device and have the downstream regulator, the upstream regulator only tap if we go too far leading to induce one or more of the capacitor banks to go back off. And so that's why we would have the negative X in there is to supervise that. And we need a fairly large number because we need that high slope. But now what if we have a storm go through or throughout the year we've got blown fuses, bad cans, we're not maintaining our capacitor banks. Now what will happen is because we are going lagging by a good amount, the negative X will actually cause the regulator to want to drop the voltage lower at the bus to induce capacitors to close in. But unfortunately there are no capacitors in service to close in. So what you could do is with a negative six, we could be bringing that if our band center was at 120, that could be lowering our band upwards of down to as much as 114 at the source. And with no downstream capacitors to hold the voltage up, we would be experiencing significantly low voltages at the end of the line. Therefore, we need the slope of negative six, but we really only need about one volt of total compensation to shift the band enough to induce the caps to come off when we need them off. So if we were to use cap compensation with a negative six, but cap it at one or one and a half volts, then in this scenario where our capacitor banks are out of service and we're not having the, the leading power factors or close to unity to slightly leading that we're anticipating, we won't drag the voltage down to where we experience very low voltages at the end of the circuit. Finally, this look at cap compensation and why it may be required for paralleling your transformers. So here's a scenario where we've got two transformers in parallel. We have the bus ties closed. The bus ties closed. The two low sides are closed. We have a total of 600 amps of load current going between all the circuits. 400 up here, 200 down here. And because they're in parallel, we have to split the load evenly. So they're each looking at 300 amps of load. So if I were to do my line drop calculations on the two transformers, I would be doing it on 300 amps of load. Now, we have a transformer differential. We open up the low side bank. We still only have 600 amps of load current flowing through the lines causing the voltage drop. So we don't need to increase our line drop compensation any. But because this transformer is now carrying all the load, it is now seeing 600 amps instead of 300 amps. And therefore, it is going to be applying twice as much compensation as we really need in this example. So this would be another case where we, if we could cap the compensation, then we would know that when we had a bank differential on one of these paralleling applications, the line drop compensation would not cause the voltage to go extremely high at the bus again due to the increased load conditions. So that's basically cap compensation. Now we're going to take a look at VAR bias. VAR bias is an attempt to coordinate capacitor banks with the regulators in a similar manner to the capped compensation we just looked at with a couple changes. The first thing is with capped compensation we were moving both bands, both the upper and the lower. We're basically moving the band center and therefore everything shifts with it. With VAR bias, we're only going to move one of the two edges. So we're not going to move the band center. We're either going to move the high band or the low band, but only one of the two. And that's going to be determined by the VAR flow. And if we don't see the VARs correct themselves in the amount of time we're expecting, we can actually remove the bias. So one of the problems with LDC in the negative X was if you had lagging and you were lowering the voltage, that line drop compensation would be there 
until the power factor changed. With VAR bias, after a certain amount of time, if we don't see that change as expected, we can remove the bias and then correct the voltage directly at the LTC or regulator. So let's look at the way this works in the curve. So again, on lagging power factor, we want a cap bank to close. So what we're going to do on the band edge is we're going to bring this down, the regulator lower edge down by a programmable amount, let's say one volt. And what that does is if the voltage is now in this range, normally the regulator would be timing to want to raise the voltage, but now because we shifted the band down, it's still in band, so it's not timing, and that gives a capacitor bank downstream that would still be out of band more time to time out and close to bring the VAR level back up. Likewise, on the leading side, if we have a leading power factor, and the voltage is in this range, normally we would be doing a lower, but because we've upped it by one volt, we would not be doing a lower. We would still be in band, and that would give time for a capacitor bank to open, because with a leading power factor, we would want to open the bank to correct or lower the voltage. And the two levels where this kicks in, notice it's a step. It's an all or nothing, and where it kicks in is a setting. You program how many leading bars and how many lagging bars and then you also program how much of a shift we're going to do and then if we're inside our band then we're regulating normally and we're not shifting either band edge so with VAR bias we're only shifting one edge and the goal is to keep the regulator in band to allow the capacitor bank to be out of band in timing and operate before the regulator so with VAR bias, here's our setting screens. First of all, we can enable or disable it. Once we enable or disable it, we put the largest bank downstream that's switched. So if I've got a 600, 900, and 1200, I would put a 1200 k bar cap bank. Then the percentage of lead and lag we want the bias to kick in at. In this case, 75% lead, 75% lag. Then the amount of the edge we want to move from 1 volt from 0.1 to 2 volts. So when we move one of the two edges, how far do we want to move it? And then how many minutes that bias is going to remain in effect without the power factor coming back into band? So we're going to, if the power factor, let's say we get too far lagging and we exceed the 75% lagging, we are going to shift our band by one volt and we're going to leave it shift by one volt until we either come back in between these VAR leading and lagging bars or after 300 minutes in which case we'll generate an alarm. So here's a little slide that shows you the differences between VAR bias which is the blue or the purple one here and the capped compensation. So you can see the capped compensation is linear which is one of the advantages of using it, whereas the uh, LDC VAR bias is a step change. The disadvantage with the cap compensation is there is no timer that can alarm you after a certain amount of time if your capacitance has not come back into predetermined batteries. And we can also, when the VAR bias is being applied, we can check off here on the alarm screen because we are going to be shifting one of the two band edges, either the lead or the lag band edge, the raise or the lower. And therefore, we may want a local operator to be aware of that. So when they come to the panel and they look at a voltage, they may think the voltage is out of band and wondering why a raise or lower light's not on, not realizing that the one edge has been shifted due to the VAR bias. So when the VAR bias is actually being applied, not just enabled, but actually being applied, because it's either too far leading or too far lagging, then an alarm light will come on the front panel and it'll scroll front the local HMI, either VAR bias lead or lag. Now, some of the DMP points associated with VAR bias is, again, we can have a status point that shows it when it's active in the lower, when it's 
change in the raise band and then these are two our alarms are when the duration is expired and this is important because especially on the lag if I've got a, var, a minimum VAR or if I've got a VAR bias duration what that means is possibly I don't have enough capacitance on a circuit so I'm still there are times in the day where I'm going lagging more than the last cap bank can provide so I've got no more cap banks to close I'm still lagging I'm wanting to close another cap bank but there's no more to be closed I see this alarm come in and it's a good indication that I need to add more capacitance to that particular circuit the other thing it could tell me is if I have enough capacitance it may mean that one of the capacitors either fixed or switched is out of service so for instance, I may be monitoring my switch capacitor banks, but not my fixed. If I normally don't get this far bias alarm, now all of a sudden I have it, that's a good indication that maybe your fixed bank is out of service, that one of the fuses is blown on it, and that it's out of service. And these are the settings under analog outputs, the same settings we looked at at the previous screen, the maximum cap bank size, the duration, the amount of voltage step you're going to change, and then the percentage pickups. All right, our final topic is going to be what we call remote voltage bias. And this is used mainly when using line drop compensation in conjunction with downline uh, distributed generation. So let's take this particular scenario here. We have a feeder regulator and it currently has 600 amps of load going out of it very heavily loaded regulator and we've got PV downstream of it that's currently offline now if we were to set our band center at 122 bandwidth of 3 R of 4 and if the full load were 800 amps at 600 amps we would be applying 3 volts of compensation and therefore we would have it at 125 volts here to keep it at 122 at wherever our load center is. Now, the DG comes on and it's providing some of the load. It's not providing all of the load. So 400 amps of the load is being provided by the PV and the remaining 200 is being provided by the regulator. Now, there's still 600 amps of load current flowing through this line causing line drop but now my regulator is only seeing 200 amps and therefore if we do the math I'm only applying one volt of compensation and therefore I'm only 123 here when I really should be 125 because I don't see this extra 400 amps because it's being provided by a source that's down line from where my CT is and therefore we risk under voltaging the end customers because we're not anticipating as much drop as actually is occurring because some of the load current is hidden from us. So what line drop compensation is actually doing is it is actually varying the load current as seen at the regulator. When the DG is offline all load current is being sourced by the regulator but when the DG is online some of the load current will be sourced from the, the DG and therefore the regulator will not be seeing the total amount of load current flowing through the line and therefore will be under compensating for the circuit. So what can we do about that? Well let's look at one more example it's even a little bit more difficult and that is the DG is actually now fairly significant and it's actually generating a hundred I mean 800 amps so that if the loads only 600 200 amps is actually back feeding through the regulator so now we're in reverse power mode and if we're not set up for DG mode what's going to happen with our line drop if we have a positive 4 that's going to raise the voltage by 4 volts at full load and forward but it's going to lower it by 4 volts full load in reverse. We're in reverse, we're 200 amps, so that means we're actually going to lower by 1 volt. So now even though there's 600 amps still flowing through here for line drop, 
we're actually going to be at a 121 here and we will definitely experience low voltage at the end of the line and we talk about this more in our section on reverse power but when you're using line drop compensation if you're in the ignore mode on the 6200A then forward current makes the regulator want to raise the voltage but reverse current induces it to actually want to lower the voltage and that can really get us in trouble with DGs so when we're going in reverse power we have to make sure that we select DG mode on the regulator and then if we wanted to have 4 volts compensation in the forward mode we would put a positive 4 for the R and in the reverse mode we would put a negative 4 in the R and then that would accomplish a 4 volt rise at all times at the bus regardless of the current flow direction so one way to help us solve this is what we call remote voltage bias and basically what we're going to do is to have our SCADA system receive a voltage at the load center whether it's from a monitoring or metering point or whether it's from an AMR meter uh, recloser we don't care but we're gonna hit, we're gonna have some downline monitoring that is gonna give us the voltage that voltage will be read from the SCADA and then it'll be written to the control and the control will compare the voltage it's currently measuring at its own location and the voltage at the downline location it receives from SCADA and the difference is the amount of drop that it needs to compensate for so what we have here is we have SCADA and we've installed an end line monitoring device and SCADA is receiving the value of 118.5 it is then writing that value down into the regulator control and the regulator is comparing the current voltage with that voltage and from that it will determine the amount of line drop that needs to be put in place and this works well as long as we're getting updates in a timely manner from the end of the line all the way through to the regulator panel that way is the load changes which is one of the problems with PV is the load when it's online can greatly fluctuate depending on whether it's sunny or cloudy the same with wind so when these uh, distributed generators are online and their load is dynamically their output is dynamically changing the effect of what they're supplying will change and that will vary how much line drop needs to be applied at the regulator so by having this remote voltage and reading it and writing it into the control and then having it calculate dynamically the line drop that would be the best approach to handle this type of scenario and so down here we have the SCADA for the remote voltage bias and we have a heartbeat timer and it's a separate heartbeat than the SCADA we're going to talk about but why we need the heartbeat timer is if we are not getting new updates from the end of line from SCADA either SCADA has lost communication with the end of line sensor or the control has lost communication with SCADA if we're not receiving new values for end of line then we've got to come out of this remote bias mode and go back to regular RX and that's what this heartbeat timer does is it allows you to set a value in minutes and if we do not receive a new voltage written into a register and it can even be the same voltage but a new value written into the register before that timer expires then we will come out of remote voltage bias mode and enter back into regular line drop even if you're still communicating with SCADA so the heartbeat is very important we also have a voltage multiplier that is there because the PT ratio for the end of line may not be the same base as what's at the regulator and we need to have them on the same base so normally that multiplier would be one but if they're not on the same base you would put a multiplier on the remote value coming into the control so it would get it on the same base as its value so what we have here is we have different settings for the analog outputs this would be a one or a zero to enable the feature one to enable zero 
to disable, then this would be the actual register that we have to write the value into. So this would be the register where SCADA is going to write the value in. Then if it's on a different base, this is the register where we would write in what the base multiplier needs to be to get them on the same base. And then this would be the value of the timer. And again, that timer gets reinitiated every time a new value or even the same value is written into this register. So when we receive a command from the master writing a value into this register, whether it's a different one or the same one, that will automatically reinitialize the heartbeat timer. And again, if we have line drop programmed with remote bias, when we're in the remote voltage bias mode, the RX is not being used. But if the heartbeat is lost, then the RX comes into play. So, in summary, if the DG is large enough, it can actually drive the regulators into reverse power. But even if it's not in reverse power mode, we still will be undercompensating using traditional line drop compensation because the... Uh, DG is hiding some of the load from the regulator CTs. And therefore, the most accurate way of regulating that voltage, especially due to the dynamic load changes of the DG versus via clouds or, or wind gusts coming in and out, is to go with a remote voltage bias where we're actually monitoring the end of line voltage and calculating what the real time voltage drop is as opposed to trying to make that determination off of load conditions.